Stonewall Jackson is among the most revered and popular Confederate leaders of the Civil War. Countless biographies and histories have been written about Jackson, but what do we know about him with any certainty? According to Wallace Heddle, author of Inventing Stonewall Jackson, we know surprisingly little about Jackson's character. Jackson is one of the most successful Confederate generals. He dies right at the high point of the Confederacy in 1863. But I think it's something more than that. It's not just battlefield success. It's also that he projects an image of piety that Confederates find very reassuring. Um, there's that. And he's also beloved for um, stories about his eccentricities or peculiarities. Um, some stories might, might not be true, but nevertheless, they're entertaining. There are limited historical records of Jackson's professional career and personal life. And Jackson himself, who died in battle, left few letters. Nevertheless, early biographers of Jackson, such as Robert Louis Stabney, John Easton Cook, and Anna Jackson, aimed to draw a full portrait of the man who would become an icon, and in doing so, these biographers often drew upon their own lives and personal agendas. Now, Dabney writes the authoritative biography of Jackson during the war that's published in 1866. Um, this book um, is very good, and from a literary standpoint, and it also is the source of a lot of the mythology about Jackson, because people assume that if it's in his authorized biography, it must be true. So for example, Dabney tells a story about Jackson on the way to First Bull Run, the first major battle he'll face, Jackson letting all the men in his brigade go to sleep while he stands watch. It's a wonderful story, but it can't be true. Uh, it would be grossly irresponsible for Jackson to do that kind of thing, have one person um, stand picket for thousands. Um, but because it's there in Dabney, people tend to buy it. Cook portrays Jackson as um, a supreme individual, someone who is remarkable to the point that he is a genius. And Cook borrows a lot of ideas from the Transcendentalists of New England about um, intellectual superiority stemming from individuality. One way that Cook shows Jackson's distinctiveness is by exaggerating stories, kind of camp gossip, about Jackson's peculiarities. Just to give one example, uh, Cook portrays Jackson as sucking on lemons while riding his horse. And that's something we know is impossible. They weren't available. And after the war, Jackson's widow said she had no recollection of her husband liking lemons and that, in fact, he preferred peaches. Um, but you, you go to Jackson's grave today and you'll probably find lemons there. Um, left by pilgrims who are influenced by Cook's book. Anna Jackson felt that her husband had been treated unfairly by the press and perhaps by Jefferson Davis himself. She believed that Jackson had been unjustly accused of being a religious fanatic. Um, so she's trying to get rid of that image of her husband. And she does so quite effectively. Um, in the 1890s, she publishes a book of Jackson's letters interspersed with her own commentary. And she describes her husband as the most loving, demonstrative, affectionate man you could meet. By the early 20th century, Jackson's iconic image was firmly established as part of the Lost Cause movement and within popular culture. But still, uses of Jackson often had more to say about writers than about the historical record regarding Jackson. Mary Johnson is largely forgotten today. Several of her books are still in print, but she's not a household name, and I wish she were. 
And she writes a novel of Jackson's life where he's the central figure and he's a powerful figure, but in some way he's a force for evil. Um, he's a cruel man, not only to the enemy, but also to his subordinates. And this is something that Johnson has lots of evidence for. She's right. Um, but Anna Jackson is still alive um, when Mary Johnston writes her book. And Anna Jackson immediately does something she'd never done before. She writes articles for the press. Um, she writes for both the Atlanta Constitution and the New York Times long articles in which she attempts to expose Mary Johnston's book as a fraud. The view is, I think, different for Anna Jackson than it is for Mary Johnston, because Mary Johnston's focused on combat and the military story, whereas Anna Jackson is fo focused on domestic life. Alan Tate is one of the great literary critics of the 20th century, um, especially influential in the 30s and 40s. And Tate's book on Jackson, written in the 20s, is full of racial slurs, like the N-word or the word pickaninny, um, things that are quite offensive. So Tate actually tried to suppress this book um, after he became famous, um, wasn't able to do so. Tate's book's not a well-documented historical work. It is more of a novelistic approach to Jackson um, grounded in primary sources. Uh, Tate looks at, Jackson, looks at Jackson as a symbol of a South that's passing away, of an agrarian South. He views Jackson's virtues as the result of Jackson growing up um, on a farm, um, surrounded by a more natural world, and Tate thinks that that's a better world. Getting inside the head of a historical figure is a very difficult thing to do, and that's why my book um, tries to look at Jackson as an image that features both change over time but also some continuity. Um, and the structure of my book allows me to examine the way that people in different decades have looked at what is ostensibly the same thing. And what you learn, I hope, is that like everything else, history changes over time.